Welcome to the Bill Gart Red Show with Steve Cohen. Our special guest today is Chicago Bulls beat writer at the time, columnist, and the writer of the Jordan Rules, Sam Smith. Sam, welcome to the show. What 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 I really like is we got to believe that we know people and uh, we're going to get to know you really quickly. Let's talk about where you grew up and I want you to talk about your mom and dad. Well, as we all know each other, you and I, Bill, anyway, but uh, nobody knows anybody unless and you should never be misled to think you really know somebody unless you really live with them and spend a lot of time with them. These are just lessons in life for me that I've learned uh, over the years going out to dinners and, uh, with you uh, no, a long time ago. But, um, but I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, as um, the interesting part is to me is not particularly geared toward anything I ent- ended up um, now, many, I guess maybe when you were five or six, you didn't think you'd be a pro basketball player. Baseball. But I would. Baseball. I, you know, I was a baseball player too, but that was New York because, um, uh, to, as an aside, they were always in the World Series when I, I grew up in the 50s. And, you know, it, it's been a surprise to move to Chicago uh, later in life and find out your team's not in the World Series every year. But anyway, it worked, I grew up in a working class neighborhood, uh, East New York, Brooklyn. Um, and my father was a postal worker. My mother was a, uh, secretary. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, nobody, and, and nobody was that interested, but I grew up in a, a Jewish family. I'm not particularly religious anyway, one way or another, but my mother was and her father. She's, uh, my parents were from overseas. My mother was born in uh, Ukraine and her father was a rabbi and uh, orthodox rabbi so then i grew up in a jewish orthodox very strict uh, upbringing in religion and probably part of the reason it pushed me away from it um but my mother is in the jewish religion women really can't can't be involved in much can't do and, and it was pretty clear to me growing up my mother wanted wanted to be the rabbi and women are not allowed in Jewish religion to really do anything. And she ended up working secretary. Uh, but she she was the not educated because I was the first one in my family to go to college. But uh, uh, she was the more curious intellectually, uh, much more so than my father. And always very resentful. I could tell that she wasn't allowed uh, to learn. Because in, in the in the religion, uh, women were subordinated, and uh, literally in the synagogue where we went to when I grew up, she, women had to sit in the back. Very segregated. <laughs> it's, it's a very bizarre, old-fashioned religion, um, which I pretty much have hoard actually. But anyway, it, it, for me, I grew up in in, in Brooklyn, uh, playing uh, as a kid, interested in sports. Um, I was, I, I was, a, I actually, I was a really good baseball player. I had a tryout with the Yankees when I was like 15 or 16 years old in Yankee stadium. Um, but what happened was in high school, all the kids grew except me. Uh, and when I was in high, when I was a freshman, I was the third tallest kid in the class. And when I was a junior, I was the third shortest. So, so I lost that on a growth spurt there which really has uh, led me to my career in journalism uh, in, in a long, curious road. But I went to uh, school in, in New York, in Brooklyn. I uh, ended up going to college uh, in New York City, uh, being sort of poor, unable to, uh, I really wanted to go somewhere and to get out of New York and um, couldn't afford it. Uh, ended up, uh, you know, Pace University in New York, actually where the Knicks used to practice. I don't know if you used to come down there and practice at all. They had a downtown gym. They're one of the few gyms in New York and Westchester campus uh, went up to. Um, had a background, actually, I was uh, I was a pretty poor uh, or, or disinterested in, um, uh, in, in uh, academics. And so I was sort of drifting through school 
Uh, in high school, it's understandable in New York uh, that you that you might be interested. My my high school my high school uh, James Madison was on triple session, so uh, one year I went to school from uh, seven in the morning to eleven. I was out at eleven. Uh, another year, I think I went in the afternoon. Uh, got to school noon or one o'clock or something. Uh, 50 students in a class, uh, 1,500 in my graduating class, 5,000. It was just a factory. I don't ever remember in four years of high school having a, having a conversation with a teacher, uh, meeting a guidance counselor. I don't think we had anybody. Uh, never, never anybody. So New York school system was just awful. And uh, so I was pretty, pretty directionless coming out of high school. Um, just chose a business major in college because it seemed like something <laughs> that you could get a job with. And then uh, sort of finding myself in college and journeying, journeying my way through, um, I got a business degree and it, it was kind of late in college. Uh, I was involved in sports and um, uh, sort of uh, transitioned a little bit to the school newspaper uh, actually to make some money and um, sort of found journalism. But I was so far advanced in business job. I went to work and I worked two years as a, an accountant in New York, the big accounting firm. I was a staff auditor, uh, tax auditor I did um, for Arthur Young, which is a, still a, a big company merged with Ernst & Ernst. It's Ernst & Young, I think now. I worked a couple of years, then I went back to, uh, decided to back to school to get a master's degree so I could get transition in journalism and then began working in journalism in 1973 as a uh, government and political and investigative reporter in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. I uh, went to Washington, D.C. Uh, began to work to cover Congress, uh, cover government, because that was the thing to do in journalism back then. Uh, Watergate, uh, government, um, uh, government corruption, and then transitioned over into sports. In the Chicago, to work at Chicago Tribune as a national reporter in 1979, and transitioned into sports in 1982. I think it was right after I, I read about when I went and did a magazine piece on the CBA, the Continental Basketball Association minor league, and met up with a coach named Phil Jackson in Albany, New York. Um, wrote a magazine feature on the minor league basketball and uh, switched over to work in sports at the Chicago Tribune. Um, took over the Bulls in 1980s and then uh, obviously turned my life around in 1989 when Bill Cartwright was traded to the Bulls. Uh, can you go back a little bit and talk about really what attracted you to journalism and then uh, when you made the break from journalism in the sports, what led you to that? And what was your break in, in doing that? Getting into journalism, um, in some ways I saw it. Uh, growing up in New York City, I, I, I to needed, needed money. I worked as a uh, delivering newspapers. And we had seven newspapers then, seven daily newspapers in New York delivered uh, in the morning I delivered the daily mirror mirror which was out of publication but it was a tabloid like the daily news I would go to school and then in the afternoon I delivered the world telegram uh, it was afternoon paper back then the morning afternoon papers and uh, when I get my you, you get your, your pile of newspapers to tie up and fold so you could throw them onto the porch or in my case often through windows or on a roof um, I would, I would spend a lot of time reading the newspaper and, and the people who wrote these, these stories, you know, was such, you know, was such sort of an excitement for me that here were these people traveling all over the world. And I was interested in sports primarily then and my mother would always pick on me. She said, why do you read the newspaper all the time from the back forward? Cause we had a lot of tabloid newspapers. And I would read the sport, interested in sports. And I would get sort of midway and I would 
finish and go to the next one. I wasn't much interested in that news or national. And it was such a magical thing to not only read about my, you know, my in the sports, you know, but these writers traveling all over the world to all these events that I, you know, would peer at on a little TV screen in black and white. It just seemed so exciting and so out of reach, like being a, pro a professional athlete. Um, and and um, so, it, so again, it was something, and I, I wasn't particularly motivated or as a result, a good student. And it, so it, it, it also seemed something like, like being in sports, playing sports for a living, uh, something out of reach. And then, um, so now I'm in college. And so I, I actually, I was a poor English student in high school. I, I, I lived, which also sort of shows, I've sort of talked when I talked to student groups or something over the years, I said, you, you, you too, you know, could be anything you want because I, I was able to do this, you know, New York Times bestselling books, uh, stories, you know, a lot of accomplishments in, in by writing and, and um, it, I literally was failing English in, in high school. Couldn't, couldn't write, couldn't, couldn't, you know, they say you have to write 300 words and I would write, you know, I would just be counting the word I could get to 300. I never thought, I, you know, it was always so difficult to get the 300 words to write, to write the themes in the English class, which I hated, I was disinterested in. Um, and not good at, usually if you're not good at, you're not interested in something. So, but then, so I was in, in college and um, I was playing back college and, and, and was pretty good as a freshman. I, I was the number one pitcher on the team. Um, and in my junior year, uh, he, he showed up and he's throwing like 95 mile an hour sliders and you know, there's this epiphany that hits you and I go, that's what a pro ball player looks like. <laughs> and it wasn't me. So I was a pretty, even though I was pretty aware that, that I, I wasn't going to have an athletic career, it was still, you know, possible. I had some moments and did some things. And, but then when a real player showed up and you see what a real guy, real athlete looks like, you know, then, you know, <laughs> there's other things. And so uh, I started, uh, I remember I was hanging around the uh, athletic office one time, one day, and it was, I was in college during Vietnam and uh, ended up being in, in the getting reserves during that time. Um, but all, all the students from the student newspaper, they wanted to write, we had protests on campus and there was construction and so it was fights with construction workers and in downtown Manhattan at that campus. Um, and, and all, all the kids who were working on the newspaper wanted to write about that. They didn't have anybody want to write about sports. So they came out in the athletic department. They said, was, do you have anyone who would write about sports? In fact, we need a sports editor. And that, that's a paying job. And I was on getting student loans and this. And I said, well, we'll do that. I'd never done that. I'd never written a story. I'd never had a journalism class. But I thought, well, you know, I read the, all these stories all the time. I know what that looks like. And so, so I said, yeah, I, 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 I've, been, I've been a sports editor before. <laughs> I can do that. So I started doing it, you know, sort of modeling my Myself after the stories I read in newspaper in, in New York, which is, as you know, Bill playing in New York, um, it's a it's a tough journalism, uh, tough media sort of market, uh, often accusatory, questioning, uh, cynical, amusing, whatever the case might be, and so I started writing some stories for the school newspaper. And we didn't have a journalism department because the university was more business oriented, job oriented, and we didn't have journalism classes. So they hired this professor from uh, Columbia, a journalism school, to critique our paper. And, and he came down one day and he, he said to me, he said, yeah, I really like your stories. And nobody ever had said anything positive about me academically in my life, anything I'd ever done. So I thought, well, wow you know, here's a guy who really does this. And I said, maybe I can do this. And so uh, 
that really was the start. And then I really started to, to be directed, say, hey, this is something I can do. I find, you know, uh, not only did I get some, some, you know, some acceptance, you know, for the work I was doing, but sort of uh, inherited, you know, kind of found a mentor. And so uh, this professor, Melvin Mensher up at Columbia, sort of directed me uh, about going to graduate school because he said, you know, your school, your work, your work with the school newspaper is nice, but, you know, you're not going to get hired that way. And so then uh, I went to graduate school so I could get a degree so I could sort of get a foot in the door and, you know, it kind of helped that I had this business background because I was hired, you know, because I was sort of facile with budgets and uh, profit and loss statements and spreadsheets and things. And so I got hired to do a lot of investigative reporting work in government and budgets and things like that and did that. And then, um, you know, after about a decade of doing that, uh, when I was at the Chicago Tribune, uh, they had a program where you would go uh, take a period of time, uh, work with the Sunday magazine, probably the only Sunday magazine left in journalism now is the New York Times. Um, but it was a great opportunity to write long form stories. And um, so I went and, and uh, wrote some of these stories. And then when I came out of that, I said, well, you know, I'd like to try sports. They said, you, you know, you can go back and do, you know, what you would do. And I said, well, I'd, I would just like to try. I'd written a couple of sports stories that, as I mentioned, with Phil Jackson and the CBA, I spent a, a couple of weeks with Ernie Terrell, who, who fought Muhammad Ali back in the seven i guess early 70s but he, he was a chicago guy and he had become a boxing promoter in chicago and so i spent a month like traveling around with ernie and wrote a magazine feature on that and, and did a couple of things for the sunday magazine and i thought you know i still loved sports i went to all the games you know i was still going to you know bulls games in chicago went to a rare playoff game and i think it was 80 Reggie Theus uh, teams played Isaiah Thomas's uh, maybe 81, I guess it was 81. And still in the seventies, I come, would come up to Chicago from Fort Wayne when I was working there on weekends and see that Bulls team with the Sloan and Van Leer and Chet Walker and Bob Love, great, uh, great forgotten sort of team. Um, and, and in fact, I, um, and I was on the, I'm on, I was on the panel uh, for the 75th anniversary of the uh, pick in the NBA, you, you know, voting for the top 75 of all time. Apologies, Bill, I didn't include you. Uh, but uh, I looked over the top list and growing up in New York and going to games as a kid, um, I've seen everyone play except Bill, uh, George Mikan. You know, the literally of, of the top 50 at the time and probably in the top 75, I will have seen in, in person every player play because I saw Oscar and Wilt and Bill Russell going to the garden, you know, in the uh, in New York, there was a, a program with high school in high school called Geo Card. Anybody who went to school in New York would know this. Uh, and it was 75 cents. You get a ticket in the balcony. And so every Tuesday, there were double headers at Madison Square Garden. You'd get to see, you know, two, uh, back to back NBA games. And so I saw all the great players and the, who came in in the, in the really the boom of the NBA in the late 50s and early 60s when Russell and uh, Oscar and Wilt and, uh, and, and later on, I've, you know, I've pursued this. I've, I've written some books on NBA history. I did one with Oscar, in which I spent a lot of time with him and uh, John Havlicek and Wes Unseld right before they died. And, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's become, you know, an interest of mine. Um, so I digress there, but I'm not sure where it was. But so anyway, um, with this interest in sports, uh, I, 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 um, it, you know, it asked the Tribune about working in sports and and and, and uh, expressed an interest in basketball uh, because not even though I was a baseball player, I was always interested not only interested in the game, having watched it uh, all those years, but also there's an unusual intimacy about basketball that doesn't exist in other sports. Uh, the players 
uh, no one other than the well, you know, football is very militaristic, very closed. You know, baseball is a very individual sport. Players are separated, uh, come up from the South, uh, most of them quiet, um, spend a lot of time in minor league. Basketball players I found to be much more, the most sophisticated of athletes, um, you know, playing before these huge, uh, when they're teenagers, uh, very accustomed to being around people, to communicating and, um, uh, I felt it was it was the best sport to be around for journalism. That there's the greatest opportunity for um, for stories because uh, you know the lives are so different. It's not like being around like golf or something. It's what drew me also to boxing. I covered a lot of boxing at the same. Um, actually, the, when you were traded, I was uh, I was at the uh, Spinks. I think it was the Spinks Tyson fight. Um, in Atlantic City and ran into Michael in Oakley. Uh, and Michael Michael started cursing about that trade because <laughs> it was for his buddy Oakley. Uh, so I got this story because I was covering, I, don't know, I was covering the boxing match at the time, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Atlantic City. And so I found boxers and basketball players, it's similar in a lot of extents. You know, boxing's unregulated essentially. It's like, you know, I, I love somebody once described it as like 17th century buccaneering. I mean, there's no rules and anything goes. And unfortunately, the box a victimized a lot. But because hey, Sam, of the backgrounds, yeah. Hey, Sam, could you go back and talk about that? That's very cool. So you were at the fight. You see Oakley and Jordan. Do you remember what they said to you when they heard he was traded to the Knicks for Bill? Well, Jordan said, Jordan cursed. And um, as Bill knows, you know, you know, Michael was to the trade he didn't know bill it wasn't personal uh, but it was personal in the sense that oakley was michael's best friend on the team and uh not only but he took him to the all-star game i think it was uh in oakley's rookie season when michael made the all-star team he he picked oakley from the team he wasn't close with the other guys on the team and oakley was the rookie then and so he bonded with Oakley early, but also in part to be sort of his protector against the Pistons. As we've seen over the years, and you saw in the last dance, all the cheap shot kind of stuff, the Pistons were recognizing, well, you know, if they took Jordan out of the game, there was no chance his Bulls could beat them. And back then, not only, you know, was the NBA a very physical league and allowed a lot of physical play, but the Pistons took it over the edge you know, you know, really with the, with, with the approval of the NBA, you know, the NBA, you don't like to admit it now, but they endorsed, you know, they were advertising uh, bad boys. They were doing adver advertising, you know, and they pulled that back eventually realizing, you know, it's like sort of supporting a drug culture and then gets out of control and you go, Oh God, what did we do? Uh, and, and, you know, the Pistons uh, physical play got out of control. They tried to reel it back eventually and did. But, but during the 80s, when the Bulls were coming up, uh, Jordan came in 84, obviously, in those years in 86, 87, when he was scoring big and was becoming, uh, you know, an icon in the league, the Bulls are losing, not, you know, being destroyed by the Pistons. And so Oakley, Oakley was the physical one to stand up to Lambeer and Mahorn. And when they went after Jordan, you know, he would go after them. And so at least give them pause, especially, a, you know, a coward like Lambeer. Um, and so now Michael Lowe here, you know, here was the one guy who had back and, you know, he didn't express one way or the other at the time much about Bill, but, you know, Bill was a center. Um, I think it fallen to a backup at the time, you know, with Patrick Ewing, you know, was coming off the bench, had been injured. And Michael and Michael Michael always dislikes centers generically. I mean, you know, who he get who did he get in fights with over the years? Will Purdue. He got he punched out Will Purdue um, during a practice. Luke Longley, those last three years in, in Chicago. Luke Luke told me at uh, one time that he never spoke to Michael in the three years he was with the Bulls. Michael never spoke to him. Um, and Michael always used to pick on Luke. In fact, I think he was he was so regretful about this, and Michael's not regretful about much. Um, but he surprisingly went Luke Australia just recently 
last couple of months, they did a, a documentary on Luke's uh, career, which was really good. And one of the big questions was, why wasn't Luke in the last dance? And I think Michael went on on the uh, uh, in the documentary, which he never does that kind of stuff and, and, and did sort of an apology. You may have culpa is that I wish Luke were in it. And, uh, you know, so he, he sort of apologized for treating Luke bad. <laughs> so Michael, for whatever reason, he never liked big guys. And, and so that was compounded. Here comes a big guy to replace my guy. And so he was... He, they were just walking out of the fight. I just got a couple of minutes and stopped him and said, hey, <laughs> you know, there's a trade. And he's, oh, fuck, you know, and so he was not happy about it. Okay, let's talk about um, your feelings of our first three championships. Talk about what led up to that and what were you thinking? Well, the, my my people ask me all the time my favorite Bulls team, and of course my my favorite Bulls team was the first championship. It's sort of like, you know, the, you, your first child or whatever. You, you know, your favorite is the first time, and especially after. So, I, you know, a team following that team for several years, building up to that, and and going through going through all the heartbreak, the disappointment, the frustration. Uh, losing regularly to the Pistons, you know, having some terrific seasons, obviously, you know, watching Michael all his years, but seeing Scotty come along and Horace come along. And, and as you remember, I don't know if you remember, it, 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 you know, so in 1990, Game 7, the Bulls lose Game 7 in Detroit. Scotty has a famous uh, migraine headache. And the uh, Pistons blow up, you, you know, I remember, I remember, you know, the Bulls win the three games in Chicago pretty easily. I remember how Phil had said, you know, if we get over 100 points, we're going to beat them. You know, because we got to play, if we play faster, they're not athletic, they're not going to, you know, we'll have the edge. You know, we can't get down in their kind of game. And so it got down into their kind of game in Detroit again. So, but then, you know, each year was an advancement. They lost in the first round and they lost in the second round. And so I remember Michael always sort of justifying it, said, uh, well, at least we've gone farther, you know, and the, the arc is now, you know, we got to the seventh game in the conference finals. Now's the chance. And so if you remember, it was right before Christmas in the 1991 season. And during the 1991 season, in Portland, there's sort of, there was a, un, all these unwritten rules in sports and the unwritten rule in is so sort of you got to get to the finals before and lose before you can win. And it happened with Detroit, it happened with uh, Boston, with LA. Um, and so now it was Portland's turn. They had gone to the finals, lost to Detroit, and now it's their turn. And so everybody picks Portland in 1991 to win the title and they come blowing out. They win, they actually they start 19 and 1. And, and I remember around the Bulls, the thinking is okay, Portland, you know, Portland's getting in the finals, they're going to win. But at least, you know, we got to beat Detroit. Just get there. And we'll lose. And then, you know, we can win after that. So the season starts, and, you know, kind of iffy. And the Bulls go into Detroit right before uh, Christmas in the 1991 season and just get blown out. Just, just lose by the down 25 again. And it can't win in Detroit. I don't, I don't know how much you remember that game, Bill. Uh, but I remember, I remember talking to Phil after and, and the media thing. And he says, well, this team, you know, might not be up to it. You know, we might have to make some changes and trade, whatever. You, you, you know, he's talking pretty openly about maybe, you know, maybe this team is, it can't, can't do it. Maybe we have to break it up. And so, but then they win a game, they win the Christmas game against the Pistons. But if you remember, it was in Chicago. Chicago and the Pistons guys were all pissed off because they didn't want to come to Chicago. They said, well, we're the champions. It should be in Detroit. So Isaiah and, and Lambier, of course, you, you know, moan about it. And uh, they, they, they come, I think, the morning of the game and the Chicago wins, whatever. But, but then even though Isaiah gets hurt, hurts his, I think, uh, tore a ligament, his wrist or something, but is out. And the Bulls go into Detroit right before the All-Star break in, uh, in February 91. 
and went in Detroit. And it's sort of like this epiphany. Uh, BJ has a big game. And it's like, hey, we can win in Detroit. Now, Isaiah wasn't playing, but the attitude of the team was is kind of like, hey, you know, we got over this hill now. And then coming out of the All-Star break in 91, uh, in 91 season, the team just goes, plays better than it ever has. Just goes on this tremendous run and just gets in the playoffs and starts blowing through the playoffs. And um, I don't know if you uh, I probably remember these things more than you do, Bill, because I write them down. And so now, so now it comes to the Pistons conference finals and it's game one and, and Michael's a little anxious about it. And the Bulls go out ahead, we got a half good, a pretty decent halftime lead. And in the third quarter, Pistons catch up, get within two or three. And, and if you remember, Phil always would rest Michael the first like four minutes of the fourth quarter. So it gets it gets even, pretty much even the end of the third quarter. And it, you know, the reserves come in, Will Purdue and backups and push it out, push out the lead. It gets up to double digits. And then, you know, the starters come back in and carry it home. And I remember it was after that game, Michael says, uh, Michael invents his famous phrase of my supporting cast, you know, which was, ba- you know, basically giving credit or whatever. But, it, it, you know, it was the rest of the team, you know, the team, it, it was, it was what Phil was always pushing Michael toward, that you can't do this on your own, that it's a team, basketball is a team sport, a triangle, you know, all the elements of Phil's teaching, you know, and all the philosophy it, it came down in, in effect to this is a team game. No individual. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know, when Phil first met Michael, when he was an assistant on Doug's college staff, I think it was before you, yeah, before you came to the Bulls, or traded to the Bulls, Phil was talking to uh, Doug. And it was tell, telling Doug that, you know, one player and Phil was schooled in the Red Haltzman, early Knicks, you know, five guys who could shoot five, you know, five offensive players, five defensive players on the floor, you know, one of the great team oriented teams in history, that this is the way you win. And so Doug says to Michael, uh, to Phil, why don't you go tell Michael? <laughs> so Phil goes to meet Michael, basically really didn't know him. You know, and Phil, when he came to the Bulls, you know, was out of the CBA, just barely hanging on in the NBA and was doing a lot of advanced scouting for the Bulls. He really wasn't even on the bench that much. They, they would send him out, and, you know, do the advanced scouting. It was only two or three assistants back then. So he goes over to Michael and, and, and says that there's only one player in the last 25 years that's won a title um, by leading the league in scoring. And that was, and Phil tells him that's Kareem with the Bucks in 71. And that this is not the way that you could win. And Michael thanks, says thank you and just walks away. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, to get from there to, you know, my supporting cast and the necessity, you know, to have, and I understood, you know, Michael's in part, Michael's point, you know, is like what we had with Derek Rose here and, in 2009, 2010, you know, Derek was, Derek was fine. He wanted to be, uh, you, you know, in a point guard um, who, who was a facilitator. But, you know, Keith Bogans was the shooting guard, averaged four points. So, so he had to shoot, you know, and he had to score 25 points. Uh, you know, people don't know, you know, when Derek was a senior in high school in the, team, in the championship game, he scored two points. He dominated the game, you know, sort of often like Jason Kidd played, you know, might score eight points, you know, get 12 rebounds, 11 a seed, but dominate a game with eight points. And, um, you know, but Michael had realized with those Bulls in the mid 80s and late 80s that he had a score for the team to have a chance. And so to transition from that to accept and trust uh, the other players to do their part so they all could get across the finish line. Uh, you know, that's what I loved most about being with that team, that evolution from individual one-man team sort of thing to, you know, the best team in the game. I remember when it got to the finals, so the Bulls beat the Pistons, you know, they get they get that game one and now it's just sweep, take over. 
you know, and just run him out and they'll walk off the court and all that stuff. So it gets to the finals and it's the Lakers with surprise the uh, Blazers and they're in the finals. But it's now it's magic and, and worthy and, and, you know, all the experience and who are these guys and everybody's picking the Lakers. And, and, and so I, you know, we, we always wrote these pre-game, you know, pre-series predictions. And I pre- predict, I don't get these right that much, but I, I predict the Bulls are going to win in five. And, and there's just this outrage in the media, you know, sort of how dare you, you know, it's an insult to the Lakers. Who are these guys? And I'm looking at the matchups and I'm going, well, these Bulls guys are all better. You know, Scotty Pippen is, be- is you know, it, is, be- is better than James Worthy, athletic, fast. Worthy can't keep up with him. Horace is better than Sam Perkins. You know, Bill's better than Vladi Divac. You know, you know, the only guy better on the whole team than his matchup was Mike. It was Magic with John Paxson, you know. Michael's way better than Byron Scott. You, you, you know, how, how is this Bulls team going to lose? And, and so, of course, history, you know, Bulls win in five. And then, it, it, you know, then in a sense, you know, the Bulls. And, and also, just as an aside, you know, much to my relief, because I wrote the Bulls that season, it was which was just supposed to be not only what it was a diary of the team but it was supposed to be just a lark for me to sort of you know give me something to do while i'm traveling on the road um you know i'd been an investigative reporter in 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 a smaller town but also in washington dc i'd covered congress and government in the white house and so I, i i was always kind of uh in re, you know, over the years, I was inspired by different books. And, and David Halberstam, great journalist, uh, Vietnam reporting and government reporting, had written a diary kind of book on, on the Portland Trailblazers, Breaks of the Game, back in the late 70s. And he had the misfortune, wrote a great book, uh, but Bill Walton had gotten hurt right before he showed up. And, and so the team wasn't as good, uh, but wrote this great inside story. And so I thought that'd be kind of fun uh just right a you know a behind the scenes you know what's the wizard really like behind the curtain um about a team wasn't wasn't supposed to be about jordan and you know jordan of course the main guy um and and there was no interest there was no interest i'd gotten maybe a dozen rejection letters when i started that project and i proposed it um it's like who are you you know who's the bulls team they don't you know you know they weren't winning anything and so uh, now we go through the season, the Bulls win, you know, become a national pheno- worldwide phenomenon, Jordan. And now the book comes out and says, you know, I hate kind of, he's an asshole sometimes. <laughs> and people are horrified, you know, how dare you? And so the narrative became in Chicago that I've ruined the team. The Bulls will never win again because I've exposed all these internal faults. And, and of course, you know, everybody knew him on the team. I mean, I just wrote about what everybody told me. <laughs> So anyway, so the Bulls anyway, also much to my relief, because now I'm under siege when this book comes out, because, you know, all the media in Chicago is writing, you know, now the, now the Bulls are the 85 Bears, you know, a one hit wonder, they're going to win once, and Sam Smith has ruined the franchise, has ruined the dynasty, whatever. So of course, when the Bulls came out, the Bulls were on a, when the book came out, the Bulls were on a road trip and uh, went on a 14 game winning streak. Went on to win 67 games that season. Most wins in franchise history, among the most in league history, and win a couple of titles. And uh, they forgot about me because then there came gambling and, other, you know, other issues that Michael got involved in. And so that's uh, – but anyway, so I, I was also personally grateful that the Bulls continued on winning um, uh, three titles at the time. Can you talk about besides – myself of course and michael some of the other guys who you had a special relationship with people ask me often you know because of the book and the notion of well you've revealed things. i have just great relationships with everybody on that team uh you know it's sort of your first family uh that i gotten close to is you know it was the first team i was traveling with as a beat writer again i hadn't even been in sports that long and so obviously, yeah, Bill, I, you know, I, I mean, obviously I got to know Bill very well because, 
you, you know, we were somewhat similar age group at that time. You know, Bill came in as a veteran guy, came into the league in 1979. So, you know, Michael was the senior guy and he came in in 84. So, you know, he's playing with babies. So on the road back then, you know, we're traveling commercial, you know, you know, and media was very close. You know, you know, I'm traveling with the team. I'm staying with the team. I'm on the team bus. I'm on the plane, plane you know, because, you know, we travel commercial. So I'm sitting with Phil and Tex. Really, my basketball education, which was an amazing thing. On every flight, I either sat next to Phil Jackson, Johnny Bach, or Tex Winter. And would just... You, you just ask him questions about basketball and talk. I, I literally would sit there. Text would read to me from the triple post offense book and go over plays. And we, he'd draw plays and, and, and formations for me. And so the, the, not only the experiences, but the education that, that you could get, you could never get again. And that's why it, it, it was a unique book in the sense that you could, couldn't repeat that because of the access I had. And I was very close with Johnny, you know, Johnny came back to live in Chicago and became a painter. And, I, I, you know, until he died, I would see Johnny regularly and uh, uh, go out to lunch with him every week. And I was at, he, he, he became painting. I went to his art shows. And so, uh, you know, got to know Johnny, you know, very well. Um, Horace who people say, oh, he was the source of the book, which was nonsense because, it was, first of all, everybody was quoted. But more than that, it was, you know, it was a story about everybody, you know, not only the players, but Phil Jackson, the coaches. As I said, I sat on the planes with Phil and, you know, Johnny and Tex. I got to know Jerry Reinsdorf well, and I still do. In fact, you know, I write for the Bulls website now. But Jerry Reinsdorf's from Brooklyn. We had many serious experiences similar experiences grew up in the same neighborhoods got to know jerry well and not so much jerry kraus but i did you know didn't know him but uh so horace who does ambassador work with the bulls now um i'm, I'm sorry sam uh go back to that talk a little bit more about jerry reinstor for your relationship yeah i got to know uh well, I didn't know Jerry covering the team initially in the late 80s, but, you know, being around the team and covering the team, you know, sometimes, you know, you get relationships with different and, and Jerry would be around occasionally. In fact, the, the famous uh, shot Cleveland uh, game in 1989. Were you on the team? You were on the team then, right? When Michael hit the shot in Cleveland? I was, I was on the floor. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that was the last time Jerry Reinsdorf took a commercial flight. He, he bought an, he bought an airplane after that, not necessarily because of that flight, but he ended up on the, on, we ended up on the same flight flying into Cleveland that day to get day to game because we played the Bulls, you know, played Friday night. You lost in overtime, which people forget Michael Jordan missed the free throws uh, that, that would have won that game, game four. Uh, the Bulls went into overtime. Michael missed a free throw again in overtime, and Brad and Brad Doherty made his free throws, and, and the Cavs won Game Four. So now they're going back. We're going back to Game Five. That's Friday night, and so Sunday we're going back to uh, uh, Cleveland. And Jerry, Jerry always had a thing back then that he wanted to be on the site for his team's last game of the season. So he flew into. Uh, Cleveland for that game we ended up on the same flight and and actually I drove him I got a rental car and he <laughs> I drove him to the game and dropped him off anyway he flew back with the team because back then I think he chartered in the playoffs um but he he he, he was from Brooklyn grew up he went to Erasmus high school and very you know a, a self-made guy grew up very similar to uh, background to me uh, parent his father worked was kind of an itinerant salesman um lived in an apartment building you know lower middle class like my family was you know urban neighborhood um you know riding the you know riding the subways to uh, ebbets field or whatever the case he left you know so he was old about 10 years older 10 years older than i am but um 
you know, I went to Ebbets Field some, but the Dodgers moved uh, after the 57 season. So it was me was more riding up to Yankee Stadium or uh, later um, Shea Stadium. And so, you know, going to big uh, urban high school, it's kind of being lost, gobbled up. I remember Jerry once told me this story. Uh, his high school had had the uh, graduation at the Lowe's uh, King's Theater on Flatbush Avenue, which was the same place my high school would as big old fashioned theater uh, that you don't see anymore. So uh, he was walking home. Then they had all these awards and, and on, recognized students, uh, you know, best English student, this, this. And, <laughs> I remember he told me he's walking home with his mother from graduation. His mother says, couldn't you have won just one award? <laughs> so, you know, here was just this, you know, just this another kid, you know, and he uh, went to college and uh, left New York. He was able to go to college in Washington, D.C. It's similar to me, pursued a business, you know, degree. And um then ended up after college, went and he got the, uh, was able to get a scholarship to go to Northwestern and, and, and the, uh, pursue a business and a law degree and ended up uh, graduate. And, and, and like in my case, I, you know, I got a job with a uh, accounting firm, big accounting firm. He graduates and got a job actually with the IRS. And I, I remember he told me his first, uh, he was just auditing, um, tax returns. And one of his first audit tax returns he audited was Bill Beck, who he eventually ended up buying the White Sox from. But so because of these shared experiences, similar experiences, I just got to, you know, I got to know Jerry because he was now by, you know, then he owns a team and rich and all this, but he's like me. <laughs> he's me. He grew up in the same neighborhood, had the same experiences, lived the same way and, you know, very humble guy, really. So, and as a result, you know, I got to know Jerry well. And he, even though I was journalist and you know, he was only keep, keeping arm's length relationships as far as the workings of the team, I was able to develop a friendship, you, you know, with him that was really sort of beyond what you would normally have. And of course, as a result, you know, I was able to learn things about the workings of the team that other media people wouldn't because, you know, I would be able to spend time with the owner as well. So, um, you know, I would never uh, violate a trust or a confidence, anything that was told to me, you know, privately off the record. I've never, ever, you know, written, written about, you know, my rule about life and journalism is the same, you know, that you don't, you know, violate a confidence and that relationships is what it both is about and that no story is ever big enough to ruin a relationship over. And um, I've always followed that. So I've always believed that, it, it, you know, if you told me something, I would never do anything, you know, that injured somebody's job or family. And so that, I don't know if you remember, I told every player that when I was writing this book, The Jordan Rules, and I said, I'm going to write a behind the scenes diary about about the team, but nobody will be embarrassed with their family. Nobody will lose their job with the team. And it held to that. That's what it was. And if people go back and read it now, I think often they say to me, what was the big deal? Why was everybody so upset? That? You know, but Michael had been built up as this icon at the time. He's on, you know, David Letterman commercials, you know, and, and he was, you know, he was depicted in, in the, you know, Madison Avenue advertising as this perfect human being instead of just, you know, a, a good guy, regular guy. I like Michael a lot, but, you know, not perfect, just like the rest of us. So um, anyway, as a, so I, but as a result of that, you know, I was able to develop all these relationships, including, you know, with Jerry Reinsdorf and it had been lifelong relationship, BJ Armstrong. Uh, I'm friends with BJ. Actually, he, he recruited me. I worked for BJ to write uh, Derek Rose's autobiography um, you know, because I got to know Derek well in Chicago and BJ came to trust me and I got to know BJ and I've spent time with he and his family over the years. See a lot of the old bulls. I talked to Dennis Hobson occasionally. I'll give him a call when he was coaching. I gave him a recommendation one, one time when he got some coaching job somewhere. Uh, 
I'll see, you know, Scott Williams I've run into occasionally. I, I keep in touch with these, you know, all the players on that team. Cliff Levingston does um, ambassador work. I see Cliff um, uh, at the Bulls games uh, often. We went down to a rundown on that team. I probably probably have sort of relationships on one level and others still were pretty much ever. John Paxson was the, you know, general manager of the Bulls for 30 years. So I was very, very close with John over the years and spent a lot of time with John, um, you know, been out with him different times over the years, been around him all the time. Um, who else was on that team? Um, uh, Scott Williams was there, as I mentioned. Uh, Cliff was off the bench. Dennis Hobson came later. And then also even the later group, you know, after you left and uh, had your lamentable year in Seattle. Um, we've obviously uh, kept in touch over the years. But the second group, you know, Luke, I was, I was in his, um, he asked me to be in his documentary, which I did, you know, interviews for as well, uh, you know, in the second group. Actually, I, I, I didn't spend time with Dennis Rodman and actually felt sorry for Dennis. And when he got into the Hall of Fame, he asked me to write, you know, the Hall of Fame has, has each member write a uh, biography of him for the Hall of Fame program. Dennis reached out to me and asked me to write his biography for him for the Hall of Fame program, which I did. And I was, you know, glad to do that. You know, so I've so I've kept the you know kept relationships with both groups. Steve Kerr obviously has gone on to a lot of success with the Spurs, but I got to kept in touch with Steve and close with him. Spent time with him when he was a player with the Spurs. Played golf with him a couple of times. Judd Bushler, I've been close with over the years in that group. Randy Brown, I just talked to the other day. In fact, you know, caught, catch up with him. So. Yeah, I, I like to view, I, I wish the Bulls would do more of it, uh, but I like to, I always feel like when you're part of something like that, that's a great part, a great family. And even though I was not a player, you, you know, I kind of felt, you know, a part of those people and what they've went through, experienced it with them, the highs and lows, you know, I was with them when they won, when they lost, you know, all those experiences. So I sort of feel a tangential part of, you know, those championship bulls of the nineties and my relationships with them and spending so much time with them. And then, you know, it was obviously a great and big part of my life. Talk about this, talk about your latest book. Hard labor. Uh, and I wish LeBron wasn't on the cover. You know, it's a lot of time journalists get, they say, well, we didn't like that headline, but I didn't write the headline. <laughs> you, know, you don't write the headline when you're newspaper. That, that was sort of this labor of love for me, um, in which I do, the way I do books now. Um, I don't really try to sell them as much as I try to do them. And that was set up, I've gotten to know I've, a lot of the uh, players from earlier eras. And, and the players from the earlier eras in the NBA have not financially done very well. Now, the NBA has tried, and, and they, they have done a lot as far as, you, you know, health insurance and the Players Association, but a lot of players have slipped through the cracks, uh, one of them being Chet Walker, who played for the old Bulls in the 70s. I speak with Chet a couple of times a week. He's in a nursing home uh, in Long Beach now, not doing well, not doing well physically, but also not doing well financially. And what happened in the uh, early 80s, was a lot of the players when they had the uh, after the Oscar Robertson suit, which is what that book is about, um, which basically was the foundation for free agency. And all, even though it, it was evolved and it would have occurred, it was the NBA players that came first. It wasn't Ch it wasn't Kurt Flood in baseball and Andy Messer Smith and that decision. It was the NBA players who were first in all of sports who challenged the reserve clause and went to Congress to testify and lobby and eventually got the first, you know, free agency. Baseball got it in effect with Kurt Flood and uh, in 1975 and Andy Messer Smith and the arbitrated decision. But it was, the, it was basketball and the NBA players who went to court, you know, basically put their careers on the line um, because 
with no guaranteed contracts at the time. And they were challenging the bosses and they were taking their league to court and to Congress and to testify against them. Everybody was potentially vulnerable, but yet from the, the top players to the lowest level players went along with this. Actually, as an aside, that's why Rick Barry in part was so unpopular. It wasn't because Rick was difficult, which he was, but he had got, jumped to the ABA and wanted to get back to the NBA. And so he testified against the NBA players in Congress. That's why they were so upset with him. And that's why in 1975, uh, Rick didn't get the MVP, Bob McAdoo. You know, there's always a lot of things. Bob McAdoo was off, often known as the only MVP who wasn't in the Hall of Fame, eventually got in the Hall of Fame. But he only got the MVP because Rick, who was dominant player that year and was easily the MVP, the players wouldn't vote for it. But for MVP back then, not media. And so uh, that's sort of a little known aside. But uh, so once this uh, free agency came into, in, in, players still weren't making much money. You know, the, 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 the 70s produced the ABA and eventually the merger, and, and that really elevated players' salaries, you know, much to the chagrin of NBA owners that they now had to sort of match salaries, and a lot of the top players jumped to the ABA. And the ABA, while the NBA tends to still look down on it and grudgingly giving them some acceptance, in the first All-Star game after the merger, half the players in the All-Star game were from the ABA. And that's why the NBA in the 70s had its worst decade. It was very sort of stodgy and inconsistent. There was, you know, teams were exchanging each year championships. There was no continuity of the great teams because so many of the great players, Julian Serving and such all, you know, Billy and Billy Cunningham jumped to the ABA. And so... And what happened in, in the, after that in the late 70s and early 80s, players still didn't have enough money, to a lot of money. And so a lot of players opted out of the pension plan, took a lump sum payments, and Chet Walker being one of those. It was a star, uh, played with Wilt uh, on the championship seven, uh, Sixers in 67, one of the greatest teams ever. Uh, Hall of Fame, you know, became an all-star with the Bulls, essentially turned around that Bulls franchise in the early 70s when he was traded from Philadelphia to Chicago uh, in 71. And, then, and that's really when they built it. Even though Jerry was there, Jerry Sloan, it was really when Chet Walker came and then they added Norm Van Leer and Bob Love. And, and that was what, what turned that team into a great team. So that said, I've gotten to know a lot of these players and, and saw the hardships that they live under. And the, as I said, the NBA have done some, the Players Association has done some, but I wanted to send a message to the players of this era that because the new TV contract had come in and maybe seven or eight years ago, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done the same thing. But now all of a sudden there's this incredible explosion of money comes into the NBA two or three years ago and the salaries yes. just spike like never before. Now the average salary is like $8 million, like the average salary, the minimums, everybody's making millions and millions. And so I wanted to kind of send a message to the players today and say, hey, yeah, I'm not saying anybody doesn't deserve what they get, but these are the guys who put their careers on the line, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, so to stand up for free agency and a lot of them, are suffering and how about doing something for them so as a way for that i told the story of the nba in the 60s and the 70s the building up to become the league you know, you know, a lot of a lot of tv and a lot of people you know jokingly sort of you know the nba didn't begin when bird and magic became you know came and it didn't you know in 1979 espn started and bird and magic came into the nba that's essentially the way the NBA is covered. That's sort of the BCAD kind of thing. You know, the dividing line 79, you know, like when you came, Bill. Um, As a matter of fact, I came that year. I know. The, the, there was some NBA before 1979, which is not recognized because nobody has film. ESPN doesn't. You know, they started in 79. And there's essentially, you know, very little record of it. And so you never see any, you know, anything about, but there was this great thriving basketball league, you know, for many years. 
uh, that had this wonderful history. And then essentially that book is that history. And so I had, I had just a fabulous time. It started with Oscar Robertson, you know, because he was the head of the players association uh, when the, when the, when the suit uh, started, uh, Bob Cousy was the original um, president of the players association. I spoke with him and then Tommy Heinsohn took over for him uh, when they had really the seminal moment where they were going to boycott the 1964 all-star game. And literally, which I tell that story in there, every player on both sides of the team was, was uh, gotten together and got in the room and said they're not going to play. And literally we're in there until 15 minutes before the game started, before the league gave in and said they would have discussions on a pension plan. There was no suspe- there was no pension plan back then. But you had every player, Wilt and Jerry West and uh, Bob Short, the, the owner of the Lakers, literally pounding on the door of the locker room. with Jerry West and Elgin Baylor in there saying, you will never play a game in the NBA again. And Elgin Baylor telling him basically to fuck off, you know, and Jerry West told me the story of standing in there and he was a rookie or second year in the league. And he's saying, Elgin, they're going to kick us out of the league. And Elgin's go, I got you. Don't worry about it. Just stay behind me. So, so there's just some great, great stories of, of what those players went through, how they bonded together and stuck together. And basically you know, went to court and, and won and, 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 and uh, achieved the first, uh, basically, you know, free agency in the history of sports. And, and you know, it was that great group of players and, and, you know, all the great, and so I tell a lot of great anecdotes and stories. I mean, literally Russell and Wilt used to barnstorm in the summer and play pickup games. They used to travel together and stop at parks and, 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 you know, choose up sides and play games, you know, for money, whatever. And, you know, so you had this sort of Wild West NBA, uh, uh, you know, owners, uh, the Philadelphia owner who was uh, underfunded. I don't, I don't blame the owners for everything. Uh, the, the, the Sixers, and this is Will Chamberlain's Sixers, used to travel up to New York for games. They would leave Philadelphia on the day of the game to travel up to drive up to New York for the game. Wilt, by the way, lived part of the time he played in Philadelphia in New York because he owned a he owned a famous nightclub in Harlem, and so Wilt would commute to, uh, between New York and Philly for the games. You know, it's like a two-hour ride. But the owner would take the team up to New York the afternoon of the game and then arrive at the Garden after six for the seven thirty game because alternate side of the street parking came off at six. And you could park on the street for free after six o'clock. And so he would get the team into the get into New York at 6.05 so he could get a free parking spot and then play the game. <laughs> I mean, and this is Will Chamber. You know, these are some of the great players in the history of the game. Imagine what they're going through. And so uh, anyway, the, these stories are incredible stories. And, and, and I, had a, I had a great time spending time with these guys learning. And I, I think I did the last interviews with a lot of these you know, Wes Unseld before he died and John Havlicek before he died. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of history being lost as these players disappear. And so uh, I was glad I get the opportunity to record some and hope to continue to record some more. Sam, talk about your family. Um, my son proudly has a picture uh, Bill Cartwright, Bill Cartwright wrote in a message, always do your best and keep working hard. So anyway, I, so I, I got married in 1976 when I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana as a young reporter, still married to my wife, Kathleen. Um, my, we had a son, Connor, who uh, in his 30s now works in D.C., works in government, um, He's a researcher and he's also a uh, uh, buff. He's a Civil War buff and he gives battlefield tours for the National Park Service um, in the battlefield tours in um, Washington, you know, Virginia, Maryland on the battlefield, Civil War battlefield sites. I just saw him. In fact, I was at the Sox game last night. Uh, The White Sox game one, game three, came back. Uh, He had driven up from D.C. for the game. To see the game drove back today. 
Today's game was postponed. It's raining here. Um, and uh, it was like in around 2000, you know, I'd started to make some money, not basketball player money, but, you know, pretty good money for journalists. And, you know, people come to you. I haven't told this story to anybody, actually. And people come to you, and, you know, and, and you want to help out people when you can. And, and I felt like I'd like to help s- somebody, you know, you know, get get to get to be able to uh, rather than just give money, which is good. And, and I, I, I'm, I, I encourage people to support by giving. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to be more in, involved in helping somebody. So we decided to adopt a child. And um, we decided to go uh, overseas and we just adopted a child uh, from China. It took uh, like 19 or 20 months, a long process. Uh, but I wanted to do something for somebody who wouldn't have a chance otherwise, or what we would consider a chance. And so we ended up adopting a special needs child from China who, who had um, the uh, cleft palate and they don't fix, they don't fix that. They won't, China, they don't have it anymore, but they had this one child rule back then. And what families would do because there was a one child rule and, and male children are valued more because they're supposed to take care of the adults in old age that they would uh, abandon uh, the, uh, girls, uh, let them go. It, it, was, uh, it was another of the failed policies of China. We have many failed policies, just as many, uh, so we shouldn't ever point to others. Uh, but it was a failed policy because now they have too many men and not enough women. And you know, a lot of these women were given up, you know, left to die and whatever. And so uh, the girl that came, my daughter was abandoned at birth. She was left in a hospital. Uh, so at least her mother, you know, thought to do that. And she was sent immediately to an orphanage, but she had a cleft palate. And so they don't fix that. And so, but we as old, because we were older parents, you know, we weren't allowed, not that I wanted to, but we weren't allowed to adopt uh, at birth. So uh, we were able, uh, she was, we were, she was selected and, and we were given a choice. Of, but once you're selected, you're not going to, so uh, she was three and a half. And uh, when she was put up for adoption to us, and I, I went over there, I, I flew over to China, uh, spent a couple of weeks there processing, getting her through, you know, all the processing that it takes to get out of there, get the right papers and everything. And then, then uh, took her back here when she was three and a half. That was in 2004. Now she's, she's doing fine. She's 21. She's in a community college program here and, uh, you know, it's had a lot of difficulties. It's been tough on her because she spoke, she was speaking Mandarin when she came here and we had no English speakers and she also needed surgery immediately or pretty soon afterwards to repair a cleft palate. And and, um, so it took, you know, it was two or three years before she really learned to begin to speak English. And then uh, as a result, of course, she she was behind academically all the time. But, uh, you know, it's done great and, you know, it's doing well. And so that's, you know, that's my small family, not quite as big as my family. But um, so my son and my daughter, my daughter's still living with us. And I had to put a sign on the door so she doesn't, uh, that we were recording, doesn't disturb the Bill Cartwright podcast. And so I got to see my son yesterday at the game and my daughter's. Now, of course, at my age, I'm trying to get her to move out. You know, we've treated her too well, I think, and move out. And so I, I want, I'm trying to get my wife to move down to Arizona and get out of these miserable winters. Um, but um, that seemed, that's still uh, in process. <laughs> so anyway, but we're all doing fine. Awesome. You know, I've, I've always admired that, the fact that you were able to adopt a kid. And um, I think that that is, you know, the ultimate in um to be able to, able to help out another human being so uh, i think that's pretty amazing uh but but sammy thank you so much for being on the show um uh, you've evolved well, thank you a- guys for letting me bore you in my life Jeez. no it's amazing thanks that's- sam very admirable you inspired me yeah yeah you you you've already well, I'm glad to feel, you know i'm always glad to be with you and, and if you're any of your podcast guests 
Fall out. I'm here for you. I'm a back. <laughs> I'll come awesome. off the bench for you anytime. Sammy, thank you so much. All right, guys. Enjoyed to doing it. Good to talk to you.